Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on the different approaches to performance and availability management with our guest speaker, Dennis Callahan from the 451 Group. Um, before I turn it over to Dennis, I just want to go through a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, uh, this webinar will be recorded, so if you happen to drop off in the middle or have colleagues who want to listen in, rest assured we will record it and we'll send out the recording uh, to everyone who registered for the webinar. Second, we've left plenty of time for questions at the end of um, both Dennis's and my comments, and so we'll have... Uh, uh, time for you, uh, for you to ask your questions. There's a Q&A box in the in the WebEx dialog uh, UI in front of you. Feel free to ask questions uh, during the course of the presentation through that, and obviously leave time after as well. And we'll address all of those um, after the after the webinar. And finally, if you do have any issues related to the actual webinar, there's a chat box. Feel free to chat with me, the host, uh, and I'll try and answer those um, as, I, as best I can. And if not, we'll ensure that uh, post-webinar we, we get you the answers that, that you need. So with that, let me introduce Dennis Callahan uh, before, he, uh, before he jumps on. Dennis is a member of the 451 research team, specifically in the infrastructure computing for the enterprise group, and Dennis leads the, the firm's coverage of application and internet performance management, uh, service level monitoring and management, and, and things to do with IT asset and service management. And Dennis and I have been talking a lot over the past years around this whole bucket of what performance and availability management means uh, to different people. And, and the reality is with uh, application growth, um, with data growth, uh, expanding exponentially, there are a whole set of questions that Dennis gets uh, from, from a research perspective and from his clients and that we get from a sumologic perspective. So we thought it would be a great way to have Dennis come on and talk about sort of the landscape and the approaches that customers and, and organizations can take to, to addressing this. Um, and so with that, um, I will turn it over to Dennis uh, when you get and and let him go ahead. Okay, thank you, Sanjay. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Um, again, my name is Dennis Callahan, senior analyst with 451 Research, uh, based here in lovely New York City. I wish I could tell you that was the view out my window right now, but it isn't. But it's a really great uh, photo nonetheless there. So uh, why don't we get right into the uh, the meat of the presentation here, and let's talk about some performance management challenges. Uh, these are kind of the most common issues and challenges that the the, uh, the end users that I talk to face. Um, I, by no means is this an exhaustive list. So, I mean, if you have other issues, we'd love to hear about them at the end of the presentation as well. But here's uh, some of the things that I typically uh, am encountering in, in the conversations I have with folks. Uh, first of all, web applications today are more complex than ever. I don't think uh, that's news to anybody uh, listening to this. It, yeah, you have images, you have large images all over uh, your, in your applications. You have your application is using a lot of different scripts to, to execute different uh, tasks. Uh, the, the days of static content pages are long gone. Uh, multiple languages. Everything's not just an HTML anymore. You've got a lot of it, JavaScript, Java, whatever, um, ActiveX controls, etc. cetera. Uh, Flash is uh, going away a little bit thanks to Apple, but uh, it's still out there. Uh, a lot of multimedia uh, content still using Flash today, and that's problematic. Uh, for a lot of people, and a lot of these uh, applications are, have custom fonts and style sheets. Uh, it sounds pretty basic, but that can still be a, a challenge to display things correctly or, or in slowing down overall performance. Uh, beyond those service kind of issues, all these applications today are typically relying on highly distributed architectures. Uh, they've, got, they've got public cloud services underpinning them. They've got private cloud resources. Um, outside third-party service providers, software as a service. Um, 
third-party web services uh, that, that require APIs, and I'm, I'm thinking about things like uh, you know, embedded chat or even e email features, uh, data feeds from, uh, from various places that you might be putting within your web application. And then an issue that people often have related to that is, you know, where exactly is the problem? I mean, I've got a multi-tiered application infrastructure. The application itself, there's, there's a database under scoring that application that the application is making calls to. I've got a physical server. I've got an application server. I've got a web server. Uh, network connectivity, always an issue. Um, I've got a storage layer. If I've got to get data, historical data from somewhere that the application needs, then that's usually coming from a storage layer, so that's often an issue. And then there's the browser. What is the end user experience, which is my very next point here, end user visibility. A bigger issue than ever today, uh, especially with the proliferation of different end user devices, which I'm not even getting into here, but I'll get into it now. Uh, mobile devices, iPads, uh, Android, Android devices, what, what have you, smartphones. Uh, global connectivity, you know, my users are everywhere today, right? All over, the, all over the globe, how can I manage the kind of performance they're getting in their geography? Uh, there's, there's tools that help you do that. And then, uh, depending on what your business is, uh, you're going to be encountering peak traffic loads during different times of day, during different seasons, uh, and, you know, hopefully you won't encounter DDS attacks as well, distributed denial of service attacks, but those are, are issues at, for a lot, of, uh, a lot of companies today as well. And if we go on to the next slide, we'll take a look at some of the types of tools we use to, to manage uh, the, these issues. One tool is almost never enough. I mean, almost everybody that I ever talk to has got at least three to five different tools in place, um, sometimes many more. Uh, usually starts with code level APM, application performance management. And, you know, that's because our research shows that you know, bugs and other software issues are, are, are still causing most of the problems. I mean, 70 to 75% is the number that we see in our research coming right from the software. Um, network and server monitoring, both cloud and on-premise. Uh, you, you know, today you're going to have you know, your own network, uh, network uh, connectivity internally, uh, your own servers running internally, and you're also probably going to have some stuff in the cloud. And that becomes the network monitoring and, and server monitoring of those cloud servers, that becomes a, a big issue as well. Oftentimes you'll have separate tools for both because one tool uh, handles one better than the other does. Uh, data flow monitoring and analysis. It's, more of a passive type technology where you're actually looking at all the da different data packets that are going back and forth and you're doing some anal analysis uh, of that data and you're be able to uh, get some insights into your application performance from doing that. Uh, we we kind of call that application aware network monitoring. Um, wire data monitoring is a terminology that's often used. End user monitoring, uh, very important. You can have all the, the best back-end metrics in the world, but if you don't exactly know what your user is seeing, what your user is experiencing, you're not able to correlate that with the level of service you're providing to the end user, uh, you're still not really quite cl closing that loop. And like I said before, when, when, you, when, when you've got people accessing di from different devices, especially the mobile devices, uh, adds a whole new layer of complication there. Web Internet Performance Monitoring, that's what I'm usually, that's what we're talking about when we, when we talk about, you know, what is the experience in different geographies when we don't really know what uh, sort of latency there might be uh, in those geographies. Uh, we don't really know what the local network connectivity is, the Internet connectivity, helps how help, uh, good a connection they have. Database monitoring, uh, that's a niche within application performance monitoring, but still a very... Uh, still a very important niche um, because so many uh, applications today are so data heavy and they're making a lot of database calls um, that have to be executed and that's a very common place where applications trip up and maybe they're making too many database calls that, than they need to be. Uh, storage monitoring, um, again, when you're, when you're accessing uh, data from historical data that you have in a storage network somewhere, storage comes into play, you have to be able to monitor that performance. 
Uh, message monitoring and management. This is more the, the messages that applications exchange when they when they are trading information, and you know we see this a lot, in, especially in financial services, a little bit in retail as well. Those kind of high transaction industries, you need specialized monitoring management tools for that. Uh, SLA monitoring. Uh, this is especially if you're dealing a lot with SaaS and service providers, because you typically don't have visibility into uh, into your applications that are that are running there. Um, so you instead have to monitor what kind of service levels are they providing to you, and are they adhering to the the service level agreements that you signed with them? Just one more headache you got to deal with. Uh, log management, uh, machine data intelligence. Uh, every application, every piece of infrastructure is generating data of its own. Um, we we, use, we gener generically use the term logs, but that, that's uh, probably be maybe a little bit of a narrow way of thinking, it, thinking of it. Uh, I'll, I'll let Sanjay get into that a little bit later on the call. Um, but anyway, uh, a wealth of information in that data that you can get still more insights into your performance from. And this isn't necessarily a tool, but these are the approaches these tools take, agent versus agent list. I mean, are you, are you having to put an agent on whatever you are monitoring? And uh, if you are, is that going to cause performance issues of its own, or is it going to be lightweight enough and low overhead enough that that won't be a problem? That's, that's a big concern that a lot of inter enterprises end up having. Uh, agent list monitoring is, again, looking more at just the data packets not necessarily uh, installing anything on a server or on a network that needs to be monitored that uh, needs to be managed. Um, but those those agentless technologies oftentimes will will inquire you to to put say like an appliance an appliance within your network, and then that will ping everything else and get insights, um, gather metrics from that. And let's go on to the next slide. And we can talk about performance analytics. This is a hot topic for me right now, and probably for any anybody else covering watching this space. Um, again, the analytics are what makes uh, the the monitoring and, and management software work. Um, Get you insights that you wouldn't otherwise have. Uh, benchmarking is one of the the basic uh, kind of things you do, where the software just kind of form you know checks things out, gets a benchmark level of performance, and then any time the performance kind of goes below that benchmark, you get an alert to that. Pretty basic, um, but some, some analysis going, that, going on there. Root cause analysis, that's where you're tracking what exactly is the cause of a performance issue. Predictive analytics can tell, you know, designed to prevent performance issues from happening. So uh, it uses some historical data analysis, you know, to look at uh, some circumstances, some uh, factors, if you will, that are going on. That in the past, uh, when when the system recognized that a performance or availability issue happened, then so predictive analytic uh, technologies tend to look for for those trends, those patterns, and uh, alert you before uh, your end users are actually impacted. Okay, dashboards. Um, yeah, everybody's talks a lot of software vendors talk about dashboards, and you know that's kind of the, that whole single pane of glass where you're gathering information metrics from multiple sources, and you are um, basically have have, the, have that all in one place where you're able to evaluate that and just have that whole view of your performance and where it stands right now. Um, related to that is kind of the manager of managers approach where if you have multiple tools that are, that are monitoring uh, your applications and your infrastructure, can you pull that data in and you know, correlate that together and get a, get a clear view of exactly what is going on uh, in your infrastructure? It's, it's easier said than done, and I, I would say a lot of the vendors probably talk uh, Talk about that, but I, I think it's a very, a very much a challenge for uh, enterprises to actually deliver on that vision most of the time. Cost and resource usage analysis. Uh, this is a good one. Uh, one question we get all the time is, how much does it cost to deliver good performance? Uh, you know, what is the value of delivering good performance? I mean, how do I measure that? I mean, how much do I need to spend exactly? to deliver the kind of service levels that I need uh, for my end users? What's the return on that investment? You know, I certainly don't want to over-provision resources that I don't need that aren't really 
uh, affecting anything one way or the other. So that's where those kind of analytics come into play, kind of give you a picture of, you know, what kind of bang you're getting for your buck, essentially. Related to that, business metrics. Um, okay, these are the kind of performance levels I'm delivering at this kind of time of day. Um, what impact did that have on whether I was able to, to complete a sale, whether I was able to get a new customer? Um, very, very important, and we're seeing a lot, of, a lot of the vendors I talk to are trying to, to solve that problem for their customers and, you know, and essentially extend these, uh, these IT technologies into, into business units. And then, you know, what we're ultimately going to be talking about the, today, log machine, log, log and machine data intelligence. Um, again, you're searching through that data generated by your applications, by your infrastructure, and um, you're getting new analytical insights into that data. And the idea is that, you know, you will find, you'll be able to find something when you don't exactly know what you're looking for. Um, very powerful technology is gaining a lot of steam. We, 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 10 years ago, uh, that, that type of technology was um, almost strictly re reserved for security purposes. Um, you know, finding, you know, discovering attacks, data leaks, malware, whatever. Um, now, the, now performance management is becoming a top use case for that technology at a lot of the vendors who are delivering that. And let's look at one more slide. I think I've got some recommendations, uh, trends I'm seeing, and recommendations uh, related to that. Um, this is a big area for me right now. I just published a big report at the end of last year looking at uh, performance management tools that are based in the cloud um, that you would actually subscribe to. Um, everything would be managed remotely by the vendor, um, and you would have a, you know, a console uh, through the web where you can essentially view your metrics, but you're not having, you're not having to keep data uh, in-house. Uh, that's all being stored, managed in the cloud. Uh, your overhead costs are much lower because you're not having to, to spend anything on in internal, uh, you know, internal management servers, whatnot. And you just have more flexibility, especially if you are running more workloads in the cloud. Um, it's a lot easier to provision new resources that way than if you're having to do that all internally. Uh, I have a DevOps strategy, and we, we, we love dev, DevOps in our firm. We're just, I'm just coming out of coming off an, uh, a project we worked on looking at the whole DevOps space and how real it is, and then we were all kind of surprised to find out, yes, DevOps, DevOps is real. This is uh, something that people are very concerned about. They're very... Uh, they're more advanced than we thought they were on it, and it's something that's increasingly important to them to get the, your developers and your operations teams on the same page, break down the silos between those two groups, uh, improve collaboration, um, be able to deploy your applications faster and more often. Uh, you know, you're, if you're using stuff like continuous integration technology where you can you know, make changes, you know, fix problems on the fly, get that application back in, back into uh, production. And when you have your developers and your operations teams working closely, when you're using tools that are, uh, you know, that cater to those kind of use cases, uh, you're really ahead of the game there. Uh, and lastly, integration. Um, always an issue uh, with these kind of tools, I mean, especially as we went, as we talked about in the earlier slides, I mean, you're using multiple tools you got to make sure those tools work well with each other. Um, for instance, if you're using a, uh, you know, maybe you're, you're checking your data going back and forth, your packets, and you notice a lot of database calls being made, uh, um, and what, what's going on there? That's your, you can pinpoint that as your performance problem. You know, your application's making too many database calls. It doesn't need to be making those calls. That's what's slowing down your application. Okay, now you have to turn that over to your code tool and find out where in the code is the error that, that you made, uh, that your developers made, that is causing uh, those excess database calls to be made, which are in turn slowing down your application, a classic use case. Um, you also want your tools to integrate well with ITSM, help desk type applications. And uh, lastly, you want those tools to be able to integrate well with automation applications so that when you know, there is a problem, 
you're aware of that problem, you've, you've tracked and ticketed that problem, then you make the fix and you can automate uh, the change and get that back into production as soon as possible. And uh, that is my, uh, the end of my presentation here. Uh, I think I have one last slide with my uh, contact information in case anybody wants to uh, reach out to me, any questions about this, uh, share any uh, war stories with me. I would love to hear them. Um, but with that, I would like to turn this uh, back over to Sanjay Sarathy at Sumo Logic, and let's uh, take a deeper dive into uh, that whole machine data intelligence uh, space and how that can be applied to performance management. Sanjay? Thank you very much, Dennis. And once again, folks, uh, if you do have questions for Dennis uh, for the webinar, feel free to ask them in the Q&A box, and I'll get to them uh, at the end of my comments. Um, let me just quickly go to... Uh, my presentation, which is just a few slides, and as, as Dennis mentioned, um, one aspect of performance and availability management revolves around how do you take uh, advantage of uh, all the data that gets generated by your, by your infrastructure, everything from your applications to your uh, middleware to cloud-based systems to on-premise-based systems, and typically this is in the form of logs, Although you can certainly get other forms of machine data, uh, especially in the context of metrics and things like that, that get uh, generated by, by your infrastructure. And, and the reality is what we've seen is that, as Dennis pointed out, application environments are getting highly complex, driven primarily by the explosion of mobile apps, devices, uh, the Internet of Things, if you want to call it that, uh, as well as that fragmented infrastructure that Dennis alluded to. And that, that makes the whole challenge of, you know, understanding what's happening in your infrastructure that much more difficult. Uh, if you just look at it in the context of how much data is getting generated uh, around, uh, around these different data sources, it's, you know, it's a 1,000x growth uh, across um, across typical infrastructure, you know, almost 10 years ago, the bulk of data was generated from from your network and from servers, um, and now that's you know much more uh, you know much more fragmented. You have application growth, you have mobile growth, uh, and certainly networks and servers still uh, constitute a significant chunk of the data getting generated. Um, but the impact of this is you have to figure out how to correlate all this information together to find the root cause of something that's going on. And as Dennis pointed out, even predict symptoms of issues that might occur and how you, how you revolve around that. Um, so why, you know, at the end of the day, why do you care about optimizing performance and availability? And, and Dennis certainly alluded to a number of different ways you can do it. From a, from a log management machine data analytics perspective, here are the things, you know, we, we've done our own surveys of our own prospect and customer base, uh, and here are some of the most common reasons why customers are using uh, not just our tool, but others in the industry to, to solve problems. It, it's around, you know, how do you rapidly identify that root cause. And ultimately, the, the benchmark that we hear most often is, hey, what's my mean time to investigate? What's my mean time to repair? Um, you know, can I get that down by 50% or more, 60%, 75% or more? Uh, and because at the end of the day, what you're driven by is the customer experience. If you're an e-commerce site, it's if you're an internal customer, it's how long do I get access to my application? Is it an internal SLA? Um, so uh, there are a lot of sort of metrics that people use to benchmark what they want their application capabilities to be. And at the end of the day, analyzing that machine data is designed to help you with, um, with these, uh, these different sort of asks or capabilities that people want. Um, now, so why did... You know, why did we come into existence? You know, because log management in and of itself is not necessarily a new function. It's not a new market per se. It's been around for a while. 
But the reality is, um, if you look at traditional both architectures and the analytics around those architectures, um, companies run into a lot of issues. As workloads increasingly move either into the cloud or into a hybrid sort of environment, traditional uh, architectures didn't give you that visibility into the cloud, into those different data sources, uh, nor did they give you the ability to handle uh, that distributed application architecture, and so deployment became that much more complex. On the analytics side, the big issue that uh, people faced was, it's all well and good when I have a small footprint and I know exactly what my application is generating. But what happens when it grows 4x, 5x? Do I know everything about my data? And the reality is most companies today uh, will candidly, you know, have candidly told us, we don't know everything that's getting generated by our application infrastructure. So can you give us insight into things we know nothing about? The second issue that most companies are, are interested in, in solving is, it's wonderful that you give us uh, the ability to analyze things uh, once they occur. Uh, but how do you give us sort of insights into things that might be occurring in real time, not after the fact, but in real time? So uh, how does how does that happen, and how do you help us with that? And so those are sort of the uh, typical challenges that we kept hearing as we started to build out the Sumo Logic uh, architecture. And so. Uh, obviously, the negative consequences of of what's been going on are, and why we've we've been able to be funded and and successful, is around areas around minimizing risk, shortening the time to value, and ultimately, uh, sort of providing uh, value around resolving application issues, performance issues, and even predicting when those issues are occurring in real time. Um, a great example of this is when, you know, uh, of a company that was using a traditional approach, um, you know, they're on our website, Netflix, and at the end of the day, the, the whole idea for, for Netflix is using Sumo Logic for a number of reasons was to really gain rapid insight into their internal infrastructure, into their IT infrastructure, so that they could rapidly identify issues that were occurring and reduce the amount of time it took to fix it. You know, so if it took uh, 10 minutes to solve an issue, they wanted to break it down into five minutes. If it took 30 seconds, they want, you know, if it took two minutes, they wanted to break it down by a minute. So they had sort of goals uh, in mind that they wanted to use Sumo Logic for. And they didn't, you know, as, as they will tell you, you know, success begets success. You know, as they grew and their internal infrastructure grew, they knew that the number of logs generated by the infrastructure would naturally grow. And so we needed to provide the, them the ability to expand um, on, that, uh, on that capability uh, over time. <clears throat> and so, you know, what we've built essentially is uh, a way to, to handle and optimize sort of performance and availability across a wide variety of infrastructures through our uh, cloud-based, SaaS-based log management service. And, and there are really two core reasons why, uh, and two core sort of foundational elements of, of, our, of our infrastructure, of our architecture, if you would. One is that we're cloud-based, and, and the reasons for being cloud-based uh, are certainly the ones you see there, but just as importantly, over time, we believe that you know, the value that customers will get out of the system are are not just from Sumo Logic, uh, Sumo Logic's capabilities and insights, but over time, the community of users who are using Sumo Logic uh, will be able to share their insights across. You know, if you are an Apache user with a Cisco network running uh, VMware, you know, how does that work? Uh, what sort of insights around that infrastructure can you get? Um, so the uh, so that's that's certainly one differentiator. And the second revolves around how we've approached our analytics. And uh, our belief is that the best analytics combine machine learning with human interaction, human knowledge. And so uh, what we've done is build out an infrastructure that allows you to essentially take uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of log messages and essentially distill them down into patterns. Uh, through a technology that we call LogReduce, but just as importantly and more importantly, in fact, is giving you the ability to detect 
uh, events occurring in your system uh, that you may know nothing about and without having to write rules around that. And that's a capability that we call anomaly detection. And so in the context of um, sort of the broad landscape that Dennis painted around performance and availability management, you know, one critical aspect that we're trying to solve is how do we give people insight into what their machine data is telling them and uh, what that means and um, how that can actually impact the uptime, the SLAs, and the customer experience associated with the infrastructure you're running. Um, and finally, the last point I'd make is just that, you know, you've, you've we've, the last uh, sort of bucket there under the machine learning on the bottom right is this concept of around social analytics, and I alluded to that earlier, and it's really around providing not just a particular customer with insights into what's happening, but letting other customers uh, provide insights around interesting searches and queries. And that's certainly something that uh, we've been building out and will continue to build out over the course of, uh, of the next couple of, couple of years uh, and make that available to people. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I think I just have one more slide that just sort of goes through. Uh, in addition to, obviously, Dennis's contact information, feel free to, to ping us as well uh, around, uh, you know, our capabilities or if you have, uh, if you have topics that you want to discuss, uh, you can certainly uh, uh, send us a note. Uh, and there are also a couple of resources for you to, to peruse. Uh, and this webinar will be made part of that, sumologic.com backslash resources. Um, so um, I'd like to now open it up. We've had a few questions come in, and I'll get to that in, in just a moment. But if you have questions around uh, either for Dennis or for myself, uh, please uh, send those via the Q&A box uh, that you see in front of you. Um, one of the questions that came in, it's more of a market question, Dennis, uh, relates to, you know, you had presented a number of different uh, sort of monitoring uh, tools and, and capabilities. Do you see uh, sort of consolidation in uh, across those different groups um, that are occurring where, you know, a vendor could pr uh, provide two or more capabilities within a single offering, or do you see that still being fairly fragmented? We've had, we've had a few acquisitions um, just over the last few years, Sanjay, um, and, and it's, you know, it's people trying to expand uh, the coverage they have um, in terms of what they're able to monitor and manage. Uh, we've, we've seen traditional vendors buying um, cloud-specific technologies, uh, which isn't a bad idea. It's probably a lot easier uh, to get the, to do that, to, to acquire that IP than attempted to uh, deliver it, your, uh, to develop it yourself. Um, the, the acquisition activity hasn't been that great just yet, I would say, but uh, there's going to be a lot more in the works. Um, I think some of the more successful startups are probably going to look to expand uh, their capabilities through acquisition. And I think some of the more uh, more established vendors that maybe have fallen behind a bit um, are also going to look to uh, catch up through acquisition. So I, I would expect we'll see a lot more deals in uh, the next 12 to 18 months than, than we probably have seen in the last year or two. Okay. And uh, in terms of, you know, with you had mentioned at the upfront, another question that's come in that companies um, typically have three or four different monitoring uh, tools um, or performance management tools that they that they use to to manage their infrastructure. Is there, if you were, you know, is there a top three? I think I'm trying to. A top three list or a top four list of the most common tools people use, or is it completely dependent on sort of the use case? You mean in terms of vendors or in terms of types of tools? In terms of types of tools that people um, that people typically use and 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 then start with, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, certainly I think APM tools are um, one of the most common ones. Um, because they can typically be sourced by either developers uh, 
or, or operations teams. Um, that's and as I said before, I mean, I mean in our research, I mean a bit, like 70 to 75 percent of all application issues are, are code related, uh, more so than infrastructure related. Um, everybody's got everybody does have a network monitoring uh, tool in place of some kind. Uh, more basic network server monitoring, uh, just to, to keep a lid on those infrastructure issues. Um, so th that's certainly uh, uh, in place. And then uh, I would say the third one is probably a technology that is looking somewhere at the end user. Um, you know, and maybe that's uh, embedded within the APM tool, which is fairly common. Um, Maybe that is a specialty tool that is looking uh, at um, at the end user intera interactions. You know, you get uh, some code uh, code snippet in the, in the uh, within the application that runs in the browser and can look at the browser and what that's experiencing, or, or it's you're actually looking more at the the internet connections and um, how is. Uh, How's the application performing in different geographies uh, based on uh, monitoring stations that might be set up around the world? Okay. So this stands out to um, three to me right now. Okay, great. Another question that came in uh, related to sort of mobile applications, and you know, from a you know, how do you see the question is you know how do you see mobile application performance management sort of working its way through? Um, uh, through this sort of the list that you presented, is that becoming an increasingly important, or is it just purely a subset of of APM per se? Uh, that's kind of a. I would say that that one is to, to be determined. I mean, we we've seen some um, some specialty vendors emerge in in that area, um, and they're they're doing quite well. They're getting decent funding. Um, and we've also seen the traditional APM tools kind of moving to that area. Um, so I think it's probably going to it's probably going to re remains to be seen, from my, at least from my perspective, as to what's what's going to win out eventually there. Um, but yeah, they're they're and when you get into monitoring, I mean, there isn't. I mean, maybe some of our panelists would have a different view, or I'm sorry, some of our attendees would have a different viewpoint. But when you get into monitoring, there isn't necessarily a, a, a unified front, so to speak, uh, as far as how many, you know, tr entrusting everything to to one vendor. I mean, you kind of want to, yeah, I think most people are still taking more of a best of breed approach and, and turning to a vendor, to the vendor who does that uh, the best. Uh, rather than turning to one vendor who you know, might do some things better than others. Certainly right. that's true at the enterprise level. Yep. And do you see one of the other questions that came in related to the fact that people have multiple uh, tools and sort of you talked about integration at the end. Uh, do you see uh, vendors taking uh, a more proactive approach about integrating tools with one another, uh, or is that still, everybody's still trying to sort of focus on their own little bailiwick first, and then integrations becoming um, sort of an afterthought? I think uh, with so many tools coming up and people needing so many different tools to yeah, I th provide I think a full-blown environment. I mean, I think we're, we're seeing more, more interest from the vendors in, in having these kind of formal integration partnerships with, with other vendors that they see as complementary to them. Um, and for starters, that can be very useful uh, to, to, to customers, to, to joint customers that are using both. Um, and on top of that, it, it, it can be very helpful uh, in marketing so that uh, customers can see, okay, this is how that product differs from that product, and they're not necessarily competitive. Uh, I can use them I can use them. Um, Together and they'll they'll be complementary in my environment. Uh, I mean, I think that's very important. Uh, you know, I'm speaking to the vendors here, but I think it's very important for the vendors to take that approach because it can be, you know, really baffling to an end user as to who exactly is doing what, who whose strength is where, um, how much crossover is there between these two technologies. Um, and can I can one do both, or do I need to get to 
get both. Um, I, it's very difficult for uh, enterprises to figure that out. Um, you know, Mindshare, I, I, think, I think a lot of companies probably have a lot more uh, Mindshare competitors than they do um, uh, true market competitors. Great. Um, once again, if you have any other questions, uh, we've got a couple more minutes. Uh, feel free to ask them in that uh, Q&A uh, dialogue panel. Uh, one question that I had for you, Dennis, uh, around uh, sort of the sort of the international scope of this. Are you seeing any sort of differences between the way uh, people are handling sort of performance and availability monitoring in, say, the U.S. versus EMEA versus APAC? Um, are there any sort of geographical differences in approaches, or is it um, – are they fairly uniform across uh, the major geos? Um, I think that's a good question. I mean, most of the vendors uh, that I talk to are, you know, they start out with the U.S. market, um, and then they move, and then they move to the, the overseas markets from there. I mean, I think most have not um, quite penetrated the overseas markets as, as early as they have uh, penetrated the, uh, the the U.S. market. Um, I think you'll probably find. Um, and anecdotally, I think you probably find a lot of the overseas enterprises were turning, you know, probably turn more to, or to uh, open source type technologies uh, that are freely available um, to start. Um, in in many, time, many cases, it's because the, you know, the vendors we see as kind of the leading lights of performance management here in the U.S. don't have quite as much uh, penetration of those overseas markets. Uh, you know, they typically are having to uh, to build service provider, um, you know, channels uh, before they can really effectively serve those overseas markets. So I think you probably see a lot more open source, a lot more homegrown, um, uh, and maybe even a lot more big company uh, offerings in place uh, in the overseas companies than you would in, say, here in the U.S. and Canada. Hello. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, there's another question that came in, Dennis, related to, you know, what advice you would give or suggest for people that aren't comfortable with sending data to the cloud. Um, uh, the question was, he had he had a customer who was looking at uh, New Relic, but um, decided that. Uh, you know, they weren't comfortable with sending data to the cloud. So is do you see a lot of that? Do you just sit there and go, hey, they're equivalent approaches. You know, you have on-premise tools, you have cloud-based tools, and depending on your personal uh, philosophy and, cult, you know, the corporate philosophies, you can choose one or the other. Or are there other recommendations that you would that you would sort of provide? Um, it really depends on, I, I think in a large, you know, especially if you're, if you're dealing with somebody like New Relic, I mean, I think it largely depends on where exactly uh, your applications are residing. Um, if you're, uh, I mean, I'm assuming if you don't want your uh, performance, if you don't want to use cloud-based performance tools, then I'm guessing you're probably running your applications, production applications internally, uh, mostly if not entirely. Um, so in that case, you would want to, you know, maybe having the performance management tool in the cloud isn't that compelling to you. So if you want to keep it internally, um, that, that's a choice you got to make. Obviously, I don't, I don't think it necessarily. I, I mean, I, I, I still, I mean, I love the cloud the, the deployment model for these tools. I think even if you are running most or all of your applications internally, you can still effectively take advantage of these kind of technologies. But if you don't, um, if you have security concerns, if you have governance concerns, I mean, that's understandable. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't get some of the same uh, benefits uh, from from your software provider as, uh, as, a, as a cloud 
uh, um, a cloud software provider would. Um, you know, you want you want you want somebody who's going to uh, make things easy for you. For starters, you want somebody who's going to have uh, lightweight agents. You want somebody who is going to make upgrades uh, of the software because you know you're always upgrading software. You want somebody who can make those upgrades as easy as possible to deal with. Um, you're going to want somebody who has modern interfaces. Uh, you know, what we, consumer-friendly interfaces seems to be the, the kind of buzz phrase out there today. Um, and we do talk to vendors who are, you know, very conscious of that. I mean, they see the impact uh, that these cloud uh, these cloud SaaS services have made, and they want to adopt a lot of that. Um, you know, subscription pricing models is another perfect example of of, uh, of something that is now fairly prevalent in uh, the, the 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 licensed installed software world that uh, was kind of borrowed from the SaaS world. Um, so you know, you want somebody even if you want to steer clear of the cloud for your management software. I think you still want to uh, expect your vendors to to deliver some of the same benefits of, of the cloud, uh, even if everything is going to be uh, run in house. Great, and I think we had one one more question that came in. Um, so I think the question was, do we have any, uh, and would you suggest any best practices around enabling logs? On, on the infrastructure side, um, do you want to, and I, I assume the question means, do you want to enable logging of all data across the infrastructure, or do you want to sort of restrict it? Is there a specific restriction to systems and network devices, et cetera? And I, I'm happy to jump in as well on this after you, you provide yeah, your I, answer. Yeah, I'd love to hear what you think about that one, Sanjay. I mean, yeah. I, mean I talked a lot about how a lot of the, you know, the majority of performance issues that people are encountering um, is coming from the from the application layer, um, from the from the code layer. I mean, bugs were like bugs were like 50%, and you know, non bugs, but still software issues were were another 20%. So, um, you know, adding for you know your 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 plus or minus variance, or we're thinking 70, 70 to 75%, or 65 to 75%. Of, uh, of your performance issues are at the software layer. So, um, I, I mean, I personally, I mean, from, from that research that we did, and that was very end user focused research, I mean, I think most, if you're gonna, if you're gonna pay attention to any kind of logs or data generated uh, by your infrastructure, I think you gotta look at the application first. Uh, I think that should be the first uh, hurdle you, you take on. Uh, and then you can, um, you know, move on to to looking at uh, the other infrastructure pieces, the network, the the, the servers uh, from there. But uh, but I do think yeah, getting a hold of your your application uh, performance. You know, whether whether you're looking in, inside the code through an APM tool, whether you're looking at the uh, the log data, the machine data. I, I think that's uh, of paramount importance. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. I think you know we use Sumo Logic to monitor our own ourselves, right? And we, and I think uh, our own internal data wouldn't vary from um, what you just said in terms of where we find our own uh, bugs as we do new releases and things like that. Uh, having said that, uh, what we found our customers to use at least the the log component of it is to very quickly discover if 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 they see. Um, an issue that's occurring, that's customer facing or internal facing, to 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 collect uh, multiple logs, especially if you don't necessarily know what's happening in your logs, to discover if in fact the root cause of an application issue is in fact the application itself or something else. Um, and so, oftentimes you may have um, an issue that's occurring, um, but you you know, you want to very quickly isolate it down to a very specific uh, system or set of systems, uh, and and that way, you know, understanding where the anomaly is occurring, understanding where the patterns are occurring, uh, is a great way to get to that root cause. And as Dennis pointed out, oftentimes it's going to be in the application itself, but sometimes you may find it in the network, or sometimes you may find it elsewhere. And this is especially relevant if you find in this, you know outside of availability and performance, if you think about security use cases, 
uh, where it, it may, it's not an application issue at all. Um, and, and that's where logs across your network, your devices, your um, your application, and even your identity management and all your security devices becomes relevant. Great. Well, I think we're just about out of time here. I just want to once again thank everybody for attending today's webinar. I want to thank Dennis for your time and presentation and uh, appreciate that. And obviously, uh, we'll make this available as we mentioned earlier. Um, if you do have questions following the, the webinar, feel free to send us a message at Sumo Logic or to Dennis directly. We'll be happy to try and get back to you as quickly as we can. Um, and once again, uh, thank you for taking the time to attend today's session. Thank you, Dennis. Okay. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, everyone.